special and beautiful, informative and powerful, and I wish it had more people from Chicago and from around the world in attendance, given its theme this year, a call to conscience, defending freedom and human rights. My and my team, the Anti-Violence Task Force, Anna York and the panel that she was on and Shanta and Omnia, all of our sessions went well. High Park Union Church, you would have been proud and you should be proud of the work that came forth from this community at the Parliament of the World's Religion 2023. The Parliament inspired this message. My title is, Who Gets to Flourish? Consider these titles from various sessions at the Parliament. Anna's session was titled, Faith-Based and Women's Rights Activists Must Join to Break Down Patriarchy. My session, one of them was titled, Addressing Core Causes of Violence, Examining Science, Practice, and Interfaith Responses. Another title, Imagining Freedom, Creative Explorations in Hindu Liberation Theology. Another, Gender-Based Violence, a Human Rights Issue. Another, Climate, Racism, and Property, the call to climate justice for religious property owners. Uniting to stop violence against women and girls. Protecting the human rights of future generations. Understanding and transforming systemic religious patriarchy. Reparations, what is it? What is the faith community's role in the contemporary movement? Engaged solidarity for embodied justice. Dignity is every sentient being's birthright. Abolition, feminism, and faith. Multicultural perspectives on the global carceral system. People of all faiths, genders, nationalities, and religions putting so much work and life energy into seeking freedom so that all people can flourish conjured up this question in me, who then gets to flourish? To flourish is to thrive, to grow and develop, reaching towards one's fullest potential, God-given potential, if you believe in God, enjoying life and freedom. And my question today is, who gets to thrive? Who gets to reach their God-given potential? Who gets to enjoy life and enjoy freedom? And I know that there are some who think, well, anyone who works hard, goes to school and obeys the law. That's who gets to flourish. You should have been in some of the sessions of the parliament of the world's religions this past week, but that's okay, you're here this morning, amen. Jesus speaks often of flourishing in his ministry right out the gate in Luke 4, 18, 19. Reading the Isaiah scroll, Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Listen to these words, High Park Union. You've heard them often, but listen to them with the ear for flourishing. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives, recovery of sight of the blind, and to set those who are oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus said to those who, was who were listening to him, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, flourishing. 
In the Gospel of John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you might have life and have it abundantly, flourishing. John 15.5, I am the vine, Jesus says, and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, flourishing. Ours, if you didn't know it, is a faith that seeks and strives for and promises flourishing. And why shouldn't all humans and all of God's creation be able to flourish? Why should we be created with potential but live under the constant risk that that potential will not be realized because other humans choose to hinder our ability to flourish? Now, I, I understand that ev not everyone encounters challenges that impede their ability to flourish. A colleague, a white male clergy and theologian, shared something on Facebook a couple of weeks ago that really, really caught my attention, and I know him, and he was being intentional. He was talking about his insomnia, that he wakes up often at 3.30 a.m. most mornings, and, and he's a chaplain, and so he's been sharing this with some of his patients, and, and they shared with him that this is an opportunity for urgent prayer. He said, what a luxury, a privilege even, to not feel an urgent need for God's presence in my life. He said, I'm fine. I don't have needs. I am full up already with privilege. He later concludes that this is indeed an opportunity to pray for those who are not as privileged as he who do have needs. It's a good time to offer prayer. But, but back to my point, there may be those like my colleague who in your minds are flourishing quite well. The privileged, the powerful might think they're flourishing. In Mark 10, when Jesus encountered the rich, young ruler, all say privileged, who also, by the way, told Jesus that he was keeping all of the commandments. <laughs> Jesus told him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But the scripture says that the man was deeply dismayed by those words and he went away grieving for he was one who owned much Flourishing is more than riches and property. I thought I'd get an amen right there. <laughs> In some ways, flourishing has nothing to do with riches and property. You can have riches and property and not tap one ounce of your God-given potential. And if that's not obvious to you, your homework is to open a real American history book and read. There's something about our human condition that others people and holds back, holds down, steals from, enslaves, injures, does serious violence to people, turns away and sends away. Earlier in our scripture, Jesus indeed says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. Our human condition and the Holy Spirit gave me this on the way to church, and human conditioning clearly includes the propensity or causes the propensity to harm 
others to hinder their ability to flourish. So the answer to the question, who gets to flourish, is it depends on who you ask. If you ask some wealthy people who gets to flourish, they'll say, well, of course, wealthy people have earned the right to flourish. And others need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps when often they don't even have boots, let alone straps, because others benefited from their labor and from the free labor of their ancestors. If you ask some white supremacists who get to flourish, if they're honest and they feel safe telling their truth, they'll say, well, of course, white people are the only ones who were given the most talent and intellect, by God even to truly flourish. If you ask homophobes who get to flourish, they'll likely say only heterosexuals get to flourish. If you ask some Americans who get to flourish in America, some will say, well, only those born in America should flourish in America. Immigrants should go back home and flourish. If you ask some young people who have been hindered from the beginning of their lives, who have not been nurtured and loved and provided for nor affirmed, ask them who get to flourish and they might tell you the ones with the biggest guns get to flourish. Or they might say by their actions that if they can't flourish, no one else will flourish. There's an African proverb that says, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. So the answer to the question, who gets to flourish, depends on who you ask. Because people will hinder others from flourishing based on bias and hatred and fear and desperation and conditioning. And since the answer to the question, who gets to flourish, depends on who you ask, let's ask Jesus. Our scripture today, Matthew 15, starting with verse 21, reads, Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David. Have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. This woman is a Canaanite. She's not a Jew. She's a Gentile. And not just any Gentile. As a Canaanite, that means that her ancestors were enemies of the Israelite ancestors. Remember in the Old Testament, Canaan was the promised land. It belonged to others, and according to the people of Israel, God promised it to them. So complicated is our religion. So this woman who is a Gentile, a Canaanite, knows who Jesus is, refers to him as the son of David, and has requested a miracle. Have mercy on me, my daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. No doubt she's asking for her daughter to be healed. At the core of her request is the request that she and her daughter get to flourish. Jesus' initial response was no response. Verse 23 says, Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples filled the silence. Send her away. For she keeps crying out after us. I need to sidebar for just a second. And this is for High Park Union Church congregation. And anyone else who needs this encouragement. I implore you, please, learn from the disciples here and other places in scriptures. And please do not do what the disciples continuously did. I know as one of your pastors I should preach and teach and and, and encourage, but I'm begging. 
And I beg you, do not demonstrate the insensitivity that the disciples often displayed, at least as it is translated in English. There is a chance, according to scholars, that the original Greek language, their, their urging implied, give her what she wants and then send her away. But that's not what was translated into the text. <laughs> All we see, and we see it often, is disciples asking people who are crying out for help to either shut up, stop calling Jesus, or they ask Jesus to send people away. If you know that happens more than once in the text, let me see your hand. In, in the sacred text, it happens often. The disciples are, are super sensitive, and they can't take. When someone approaches them that makes them uncomfortable. And they don't know what to do. And so what they do is say, shut up. Stop calling Jesus. Get away. Jesus, send them away. And I'm begging High Park Union Church. When someone's presence makes you uncomfortable and they've done nothing else to make you believe that they are a real threat, you're just uncomfortable with their presence, I'm asking you to pause and reflect on the disciples and Jesus never doing what he told them to do, what they told him to do. I want you to pause and think that maybe this is an opportunity to help somebody. Pause and think that whatever you think they are disturbing in the moment, maybe their humanity and their wellness is more important. Pause and think, how can I help this person today? And, and if, the, if you feel like being alone is not the right thing, and that often is the case, Say, hold one second and get you some help so you can help somebody. The way to get past your phobia is to try and try again. Pause and ask, how can we as a church help? You're not alone. The great thing about church is that you are in community. And there is someone you can pull along, one of the pastors or anyone in the congregation to say, would you stand with me as I try to help this person? The disciples did indeed feel comfortable just saying, send her away. And I believe that Jesus took that as a cue to teach. Teach his disciples. As, so I believe he went into teaching mode like only Jesus could. Let me make this a teachable moment on who gets to flourish. So Jesus finally responds and he answers, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. How did Jesus just create a teachable moment? He shockingly and basically said no to her request. Highlighting their ethnic differences. Jesus knew where he was and, and who she was and what was going on in displaying Jewish supremacy. In other words, I can't help you because you're not Jewish and only Jews can receive from me. In other words, only Jews get to flourish. Did Jesus mean it? Oh, you should read what the scholars say. They throw Jesus right up under the bus. I believe Jesus was teaching. All we have is his words. We don't have his tone. We don't have his facial expression, his inner thinking. We'll let it stand for now. Let's keep going. He sets the stage for the woman to respond. She pleads further. Verse 25 says, the woman came and then knelt before him. Lord, help me. Here we go with Jesus. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Can't you just see the disciples going, yes, he got her. 
she said, yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. He got the right one today. Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. And I bet the disciples looked dumbfounded. They were confused. They thought he was going one way because they did ask him, send her away. But she got her request. Did you hear the answer to who gets to flourish? According to this story, the one who self-advocates and refuses to take no for an answer. Those who, excuse me, who will speak truth to power, stand up to power, demand what they need and deserve, and are keen and wise as the one holding the power. That's who gets to flourish sometimes. Frederick Douglass said it this way, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. He said, find out what any people will quietly submit to and you have found the exact measure of injustice and wrong that will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with words or blows or both, Frederick Douglass said. This woman continued to resist with words. I'm so glad it didn't come to blows. And if by chance you hear this sermon and you are in a situation where you are being held back and unable to flourish, I pray that you find your voice and that you come to, desire, to a desire of what you need and want and deserve so badly that you'll speak up for yourself. You know, a lot of us take a whole lot. And if we would just speak and say, no, stop, you are harming me. I will not accept this. It will go a long way. Jesus called this faith. He said, woman, you have great faith. For those who wonder if advocacy work, speaking up for justice is an act of faith or part of our faith tradition, the answer is yes. Being an advocate, especially a self-advocate, or, or I shouldn't say especially, but being a self-advocate, is being a person of faith, Jesus said it to the woman. But what if you're not the one in need, like my friend who can't think of what to pray for himself? What if there's nothing that you need to advocate for yourself because you are indeed power in whatever situation you are in? You can advocate on someone else's behalf. Here's another story in the gospel that, that makes this point. Just then, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher. Some of you know this story. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to get into the house where Jesus was because of the crowd, they went up on the roof for this brother, let him down on a stretcher through the tiles to the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Jesus called this faith. He said, because of their faith, friend, your sins are forgiven you. And he says, I say to you, stand up, take up your stretcher and go home. And immediately he stood up before them, took what he had been laying on and went home glorifying God. If you are a Christian and there are moments where you can't find something to do, no needs of your own for which to cry out to God, you're flourishing and all is well, you can still exercise your faith by being an advocate for someone else. But sometimes the answer to the question, who gets to flourish, is the one for which someone else was willing to be an advocate. And at this very moment, right here in Hyde Park, in our community, the homeless need advocates, the immigrants need advocates, there are young people who need advocates, there are elderly who need advocates, the incarcerated always need advocates. There are people in other countries and other lands who need advocates. There's never a shortage of people who need advocates, and it doesn't even take a whole lot of energy. Sometimes it just takes 
the pen. It would do our hearts good to help somebody else. It, it might heal your heart to be an advocate for someone. It might even heal your depression to be an advocate for someone else. It would make God proud, I believe, in Jesus too, as he was for the woman. If you serve as an advocate, Jesus applauds that this woman does not just accept his pushback, his resistance, his apparently discriminatory no. He pushes her to keep pushing. And she does, and we should, if not for ourselves, then for somebody else. For the answer to who gets to flourish is often the one who has an advocate. That's usually who gets to flourish, but that exchange between Jesus and the woman gives us another answer. Did you see it? Who gets to flourish? Let's listen to the text again. Listen in. The woman came and knelt before him. I'm almost done. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She says, yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs from the fall from the master's table. Then he said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed. This woman also gets to flourish. And so does her daughter. Because Jesus changed his mind. Jesus, who initially did not respond, and then responded in a very Jewish supremacy way and stays on that even calling this woman and the Gentiles dogs displays a change of mind. Jesus starts off wrong, but he doesn't stay wrong. He demonstrates the ability to make a shift. And as sure as my name is Veronica, I am sure that some humans in power stay wrong because they don't, they're, they're too proud to change. Too proud to show that while they were wrong, as a result of good advocacy, they changed their mind. They'd rather just stay wrong and do more harm than to be caught admitting they were wrong and changing their minds. It's an unfortunate situation. If Jesus had stuck with his no, this woman would have been left in pain and misery and her daughter who would have remained in her unfortunate condition, but one, because her mom was an advocate, and two, because Jesus demonstrated that those in power can change their mind. The woman and her daughter can flourish. Sometimes the answer to who gets to flourish is the one who has an advocate, and sometimes it's the one who encountered a person who was willing to change their mind. Don't be so harsh that you can't change your mind. Don't be so prideful that you can't change your mind. Don't be so caught up in your power that you can't change your mind. This is for the powerful who might get this on Facebook. I know you're not in here. The real power is to advocate for others. Amen. And even more power, Jesus demonstrates, is the power to change your mind so that others can flourish. This is our work as Christians. This is our work as humans. This is our work as people of faith to help others flourish. Time after time, Jesus does this. This child, the woman with the issue of blood, blind Bartimaeus, the man at the pool, the multiple demi demoniacs, which was likely mental illness in that day. Time after time, Jesus changed someone's condition so they could flourish. He was an advocate. We need to pick up that that attribute of Jesus and be an advocate. He indeed said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly. He's an advocate for us. 
let the answer to who gets to flourish occasionally be the one who encounters you. <laughs>